if nothing else, composing will help you figure out who you are and what you hear and will help you expand your voice. Welcome to the Loud Noise Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Walsh. Loud Noise is where I dig into conversations with some of my favorite musicians. Our goal is to share experiences and ideas that you can use in your own creative development. From breakthroughs and challenges to successes and lessons learned, you'll have a front row seat to the best show in town. I'm a guitar player, writer, producer, living in Prague, Czech Republic, via Nashville, via New York City. I've spent my life living the dream and making music. I've had a lot of help along the way, and this is a chance for me to share some of what I've learned with you. So let's crank it up and join me in welcoming today's guest for some loud noise. This week on Loud Noise, I have part two of my conversation with pianist and keyboard player Henry Hay. If you're listening to this at release time, Henry's currently on tour with his band Fork. Please go to their website, forkmusic.com, to find out more information about where they'll be playing. That's F-O-R-Q music.com. Hey there, everybody. My guest this week is music maker Henry Hay. Living in New York City, Henry's a keyboard player, a band leader, a musical director, a composer, and a producer. And he does all of these very well. He's also a member of the Australian synth-pop sensation Empire of the Sun and was a member of the critically acclaimed quartet Rudder. When Henry's not working on his own music, he's an in-demand musical director, producer, composer, and arranger. Active in the world of film, television, and video games as a composer and orchestrator, his work can be heard in films such as Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle, Dumb and Dumber 2, and many others. Additionally, Henry appears as a piano and keyboard player on many major motion picture soundtracks, including Ocean's 12, Ocean's 8, and Zoolander 2. Henry's been called on by many iconic artists to serve as a musical director and arranger, including George Michael, Rod Stewart, and David Bowie, who chose him as an arranger and musical director to help reimagine his classic songs and to shape new ones, creating the sound for what would become Bowie's final work, Lazarus. His professional credits go on and on, and you can find out more about Henry at henryhay.com. This week, we're going to focus on his life as a musical director and arranger working for other artists. I wanted to take a second and thank everybody for all of their feedback. It's very constructive, and please keep it coming. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the show and leave me a review, particularly on iTunes. It really helps me get the word out about the show and share these interviews with as many people as possible. And with that, please enjoy my interview with Henry Hay. You've also worked as a right hand to a lot of really, really great vocalists and artists and songwriters and David Bowie with George Michael, Rod Stewart. The Rod Stewart opportunity came through... um, Came through some musicians in New York. I think it was Conrad Korsh who recommended me to Jill Delabate. Jill already knew of me uh, from something else. Jill's a contractor in New York. And for to do a TV show in support of Rod Stewart um, doing his standards. Uh, and it was sort of the idea was to pick up, pick up a a studio band it was sean pelton of course he's a master and uh and ben butler and conrad korsh and me along with some strings playing some rod stewart standards on good morning america and then we ended up doing a bunch of tv shows and supported those and then after a while um we did some sort of live dvd in new york and i was playing a lot of accompanying opening parts and rod became very comfortable with me and then came to ask me to be part of the tour and then to be the MD. And I got the opportunity to return the favor to Conrad. And they said, who should we have on bass? And I said, well, Conrad, of course, because it's been working out great with Conrad. And and I did that gig uh, touring with Rod for several years until this sort of, they stopped doing the standards. Uh, Conrad stayed on with Rod Stewart for 15, 16 years. Um I wanted to just jump back for a second because you said something in passing that I, I think is is something that's really important is that he became comfortable with you. I think so often with artists like that, you can never underestimate that piece of the puzzle. I mean, you can never underestimate it with anybody, 
but that's kind of a non-musical thing. There's musical. There's a musical component to it, but there's a lot of non-musical stuff that goes along with someone developing that comfort factor with someone and wanting to kind of work more closely with them. Sure, I, I think that I think that artist trust has been the number one factor in my being successful with uh, you know or being asked to be involved with these artists is that eventually setting up musically or otherwise a situation for the artists where they feel comfortable and they feel like they can do what they want and that I have their best interests at heart. Um, certainly that was the case for the Rod Stewart situation, kind of walking him through these standards on live TV from the piano and, and making him feel comfortable. And um, and producer trust, of course, a producer who feels like you're going to deliver and make them comfortable and defer to them. And that was my situation with Phil Ramone, who I got to, I started working on little things with him and they kept calling me because he knew that he could predict what he would get from me. And, and that uh, I learned to not overstep with him. Uh, it was very important to, to make sure that, uh, it was clear that he's the producer and, and, and essentially not, not in it, a derogatory way, but stay in your lane enough to to play a supportive role. Was that intuitive for you? It was, but it was something that I had to learn some about. Um, and I was, I remember a very clear uh, time. Uh, I mentioned Sean Pelton. Sean Pelton is, if for any listeners who don't know of Sean Pelton, Sean Pelton's a he's a storied New York studio drummer. Uh, he's been the drummer for the Saturday Night Live band for 16, 17, maybe 18 years. And he's played with everybody. And he makes every singer comfortable. He's just so good at it. He reads them. He figures out what they want. And it, and all artists love him. And producers love him. <clears throat> and I remember sitting out on Sean's balcony. And I was sort of saying, well, you know, things feel like they're slow right now. And Sean gave me a a piece of advice that I'm not sure if it was directed exactly at me or if it was just a general piece of advice that he found to be true. And I think it's absolutely true. And he said, he said, you know, you'd be surprised how much money you can make if you just shut up. And that was really interesting because, you know, he's basically saying, do your job in that situation, talking about working with producers do your job and be supportive, but don't don't try to take over the gig. Don't try to, you know, don't try to become the producer. Don't try to upstage somebody and just, you know, don't offer opinions that aren't asked for. And I thought that was really interesting and it's absolutely true in that situation. And this is not this is not the same for a collaborative creative situation. This is much more working in a in a studio situation. If you're working as a hired musician for a certain role, then you should occupy that role and not step beyond it. And I think it's absolutely true. And when I figured that out, especially with Phil Ramone, it was very beneficial. Wow. What a great piece of advice. Yep. Yep. And he's still one of the busiest musicians in New York, for sure. Uh, and and Phil went on to recommend me to work with George Michael because I'd been working with Phil and Phil went on to recommend me to be George Michael's musical director. And... um. And then after working closely with George, George got comfortable with me um, because I think because George enjoyed the fact that uh, I never I was I never tried to deceive George about what was possible. I was always very matter of fact with him. I had the feeling that some people in George's circle were purely only deferential and not necessarily giving him any... They were afraid to give him any any news that they would perceive as bad. But I think George wanted to just know where the ground was. This is possible. This is not possible. We'll have it for you tomorrow. That kind of, that kind of language. You know, we can't do it today. We can't make this happen this very second, but I promise I'll have it tomorrow. And I think that George appreciated reality in that situation. In the role of producer or musical director, did it take some learning to learn how to navigate the the different sides of the camps and you know? Oh yes, yeah. 
There's politics on every gig. I'll just say that. And and the politics on the George Michael tour were different from the politics on the Rod Stewart tour. Um, the crews were different. And a lot of that stuff comes from the top, you know, the way that the artist conducts themselves and treats other people does trickle down. It's pretty interesting, but certainly learning how to be a good people person and walk the tightrope between expressing what you need and appreciating other people's opinions is a, is a skill that they don't teach you in college. Did you feel like you, you've always had those kind of skills, or did you feel like no. you had to develop them? Had to develop them for sure. You know, when I was at when I was in school, I was I was definitely very lopsided. It's all about music and being sort of a music dork and and being driven about music and being specifically driven about certain styles of music and not nearly being as open about some music as I should have been and certainly not not appreciating everybody's vantage point, whether it's musical or non musical, and and that is some. That's a skill that you must have if you're going to be an effective musical director. How did you come to that? Were there some did did you have a mentor or did you read books or how how did you sort that out? Uh well, some of it was observation and some of it was being a sideman in other ensembles and watching how things would happen. I I worked as a sideman for a short while with Blood Sweat and Tears and I worked with a saxophone player Bill Evans. Um, so there was some structure there and then most structured before Rod Stewart was Harry Belafonte and Harry's son was kind of his tour manager and there was a musical director and Harry was moody. Harry was an incredible showman. I learned so much about showmanship and timing and, and, and being in the hot seat as a keyboard player there, uh, being on Harry's gig, but there was interesting to watch the dynamic of how people would kind of stay in line or get out of line. And as not that that band was wild in any form, but a band that plays a lot like that with a, a known artist and musicians, you know, you have this flex, this ebb and flow of the way the dynamic works. So observing that was, was informative. And then seeing sort of some of the the growing pains in camps, uh, you know, a camp as large as Rod Stewart's band was interesting too because there's definitely politics. There's a manager, there's a production manager. They both have a lot of power. Ultimately, they're deferential to the artist, but the artist may opt to stay completely out of it and it looks like the production manager's the bad guy and you're not sure if they are. Um, it's pretty interesting in both of those two situations in particular with George Michael and Rod Stewart, um, were those people, are they people that like to spend time with the musicians on the music or, or were you guys pretty isolated from one another? I think with both of those artists, we didn't do a lot of playing that wasn't in sound check. Now with George, I was a little more lucky because we spent, geez, we almost spent two months in at Air Studios in London. And a lot of that was just with this core quartet from New York with Phil Ramone but George would come in and we'd have a chance to work on the music with him a little bit but it wasn't like George came in and said all right like guys let's let's get it together to now and we're going to run this song or we're going to run that song so I, I, I suppose they were similar in that way and that's not untypical of a lot of legacy artists of that level to say all right band get it together and then I'll come in for a sound check and it needs to be together and and there's an expectation that you need to not be screwing up and things need to sound right by the time the artist gets there. Well, that leads me to my next question was, would you say you have a system, like whether it's as an MD or as just a as a keyboard player, when the music comes in or when the gig comes in or the opportunity, how do you prioritize and how do you go from the call to the performance? How do you, how do you get it together? Uh... Well, it depends on what the gig is. Um, sometimes when you get the call, you're not sure what's going to happen. And that happens with, I'm fortunate to get to play some multi-artist events. And I say fortunate because typically they're so surprising. And sometimes the experiences with artists, although fleeting, are really incredible. I'm, I'm, I've been a member of the house band for the uh, Songwriters Hall of Fame Awards, which is a non-televised event that happens every June in New York. 
and it wouldn't you wouldn't think it's a big deal, but actually they honor incredible songwriters, and we've had this this litany of fantastic legendary songwriters that perform and show up last year we had neil diamond and in the past we've had you know we've had carol king we've had all these other great writers and and uh musicians that come and we get a chance to play to play music of our childhood or music of our lifetime with the artist and to try to get it right so in those situations sometimes we don't know what music is going to happen and what the artist is going to want so Maybe I'm going to start internalizing their music in general. I played a Joe Walsh gala in New York in the fall. And we didn't know what we were going to play for Joe. But I went on uh, online and found Joe's 10 most known hits and started listening to them nonstop. Just so that I could internalize the parts and the mechanics of that music and maybe what the keyboard parts were going to be and how it's going to feel and start looking at live versions of it so that I could be do some homework in advance before they say, well, we're going to do these five songs or these six songs because it's going to change. You know, and you start to try to get that stuff in your head because music is, again, an oral art and whether they give you a chart or not, you need to understand how things feel and how they sound. Uh, so I would say that's my process for for all music. If there's anything I can listen to first, if some if a jazz musician calls me and says, "Hey, you want to play my little gig in town?" and I'll start looking online to see if they played it live because if they made a recorded version, it may be different from what it's evolved into in a live version. And that's the same with pop artists. So this Joe Walsh thing, you know, if you listen to "Life's Been Good to Me," which we played, and you listen to the live versions. It's a little different. People are playing different stuff. Maybe the ending's different. Now Joe's going to come into the room at the last second and say, hey, let's do that ending that we usually do. And if you haven't listened to that online or sussed it out in some degree, you're going to be lost. Yeah, yeah. It's all, of, it's all about the preparation. Yeah, having some, at least an awareness of saying, wow, this is not completely unfamiliar to me. I think I can navigate this because you've heard it. And the other thing is that if you... If you're playing with a, a Joe Walsh or a, you know, a Harry Belafonte or a Rod Stewart and you come into this gig and you you listen to the notes, you may not realize that some part that you feel is a small part is actually a huge part to them and has always happened on every gig and it becomes a corning, a, you know, a, a cornerstone or a turning point in the music and if it's not there it feels completely wrong to the artist. And you can't always know that, but I used to be surprised by that. Oh, that that thing is really that important? Yes, it must be there. It's always been played by everybody who's ever done the gig. So do you start at that level and then as you get a sense of what, you know, what the vibe is, then you start to maybe loosen that a little bit or experiment? If you can figure out those important parts and like I said there sometimes they're very elusive. When the artist comes into the room, you start playing it like that. And then maybe the artist will say, "Oh yeah, yeah, we're not doing that anymore." But at least you've addressed what they they're looking for. But if you just come in on a surface level and say, I've got the chords, but you don't have the feel or you don't have certain stops or you don't have certain parts that feel like they show up in every live version and every recorded version you've heard, then you're going to be in trouble. Kind of begs the question to me, were there some formative experiences earlier on playing with singers that prepared you for this? I think the biggest gigs that exist, the most biggest meaning most moneyed or standard gigs that pay money are with singers, certainly more than instrumental music. So um, I think I just, I was observant about singers and and how singers like to feel. And I, I certainly won't say that I'm the best at it. There are lots of great, great accompanists and people like um, Larry Goldings come to mind. You know, he's a really masterful accompanist, accompanist, which is why James Taylor and Bonnie Raitt are happy to have him on their tour right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think observing how things interact with singers is really important. And like I said, with Harry Belafonte, I learned a whole bunch from that guy because he was so demanding and he had such a, sh- a shtick, for lack of a... And I don't mean to cheapen his show with that, but he had a very old-school showmanship about his show... And the nuance of how you played that chair was really, really important. In fact, that gig was so high pressure for the piano chair that when I got 
when I started playing with Rod Stewart in arenas, I thought, well, this is not a big deal because it's not nearly as <laughs> high pressure as playing with Harry Belafonte. Yeah, it's great school. Yeah. <laughs> you also worked with David Bowie as a musical director for his Lazarus project. Did that evolve out of these other gigs or is this a whole nother tangent in your life that came to be? I met producer Tony Visconti working with uh, Lucy Woodward on Lucy's Verve record called Hooked. And I'd known Lucy for years from playing weddings uh, years before. And so I worked on that record and kind of hit it off with Tony. And then Tony called me to play on two other sort of smaller records. And then uh, he called me up a couple years later and said, hey, uh, are you free such and such date? And I said, yeah, I think so. I have to move something around. He said, you're going to want to do this. And he didn't say anything more. And nobody knew anything about Bowie, but I had somehow a guess in my head. It's a relatively natural conclusion based on their history, sure. That's right. But Bowie hadn't done anything for a long, long time. And and he'd basically been in hibernation. And I went into the magic shop, which is unfortunately now gone, but I went into the magic shop and there's Tony and there's Mario McNulty, the engineer, and there's Bowie. And the first thing that I did was play piano on uh, Where Are We Now? And Bowie was just very natural and, and disarming and, and a gentleman from the very beginning just wanted to hear what what there was no it was not a high pressure situation it was super relaxed and ended up doing that and then doing some other keyboards and some other songs and then uh but I sort of came in on the on the latter end of the that record the next day but then he David told Tony to get me back in and asked for me specifically, and we did more sessions. Uh, I don't know if we did another one at the Magic Shop or we did them at Tony's studio instead of Human. And then David called me back for a third session, and we did some tracks for extended cuts, and we were getting quite comfortable. I remember that last session David was playing stuff on YouTube that he found interesting, and we were talking about music and drinking coffee and playing little bits of music, and, and it felt very comfortable and friendly. And then uh, that was at the very end of the next day. It might have been actually after the initial release, and these were extended cuts. And then a few months later, uh, maybe five months later, David's uh, manager, Bill Zisblett, called me and said, hey, can you come into the office? And uh, I said, sure. And I came into the office, and I signed a confidentiality agreement, and he said, David wants to David wants to." Uh, work on a on a theater piece of musical and he thinks that you're the only guy who can do this and i was i was floored i you know i I was saying yes before he finished the sentence i'll do whatever of course sign me up i'll do whatever (laughs) get coffee sweep the floors and then you know we started this discussion about what would become lazarus from the very beginning and and there was there were songs that uh were in contention, and I was to get them in shape to play them for a workshop. And we did a workshop in New York, and I played upright piano in a theater room, a black box theater room, rehearsal room, and went through the songs. And And everybody was very happy with the workshop. I hadn't done a workshop before. I didn't know what to expect, but all the producers and David and everybody was very happy with it. And then shortly after that, we started in earnest uh, making arrangements and figuring out concept. And of course, I was a fan of David's music and a fan of pop and rock music of that generation, especially. And and I learned a lot about about theater through this whole process, you know. What are the similarities between like a big arena production? Are there similarities and are there differences that you could characterize? Uh, well, between a full-blown Broadway production and arena production, there are certainly similarities because those big productions tend to have a lot of technically involved stuff. And uh, Lazarus was a visually stunning piece. And there was a lot of projection and set design. And um, on the tech side, I had written the entire score to a click, even though though there are moments that feel like they're not on click. I, I clicked it all because I thought this is a perfect 
structure and safety net, and I won't have to be waving my arms. I can focus on playing the piano, and everybody will be on inners, and I'll put audio cues into verbal cues into the inners, and then everybody can feel comfortable knowing exactly when everything's happening. So we had we had an Ableton playback rig, and the keyboard was a main stage software rig with all the different sounds for every song and. And I wrote all the, I created the ambient music that happened between the stuff. So yeah, in in a similar to a pop show, there were a lot of similarities there. It's very complex, but once it's all figured out, and if you if you haven't set it up in a precarious manner, it can work flawlessly. Knock on wood. And now that it's kind of been built, it's not been so hard to recreate. When we put it on in London, and then when we put it on later this year in Amsterdam, it won't be. I already know what what's going to happen. I already have all the main stage information and we have all the, you know, I have all the clicks and tracks that we built. So uh, it's just basically about getting the band to feel things the right way and the actors to feel things the right way. When um when will you do it in Amsterdam and for how long? Uh, I'll do exactly what I did in London, which is to start this thing in, uh, in Amsterdam uh, at the end of August starting into rehearsals with band and actors, and then we open October 13th, I think. So I will be there from the beginning of rehearsals and the build in the theater until until through opening night, and then I, le- I hand it off to the Dutch band. It's an all-Dutch production. In fact, the text is in Dutch because it's an Ivo van Hove-directed piece, and he's he's the king there. So it's a, it's pretty special for them, and they're making a big deal of it. Oh, that's great. It'll be nice to spend that kind of time in Amsterdam, too. It's a great city. Yeah, I'm very excited about six weeks in Amsterdam. I've I've only been there for a couple of days at a time. Wow, super cool. Now, in working with David Bowie, what did you learn from working with him? First of all, he was, he was just such an incredible human being. He was so kind and and energetic and excited about music and creating. And he was excited. It's important to keep his perspective that he was more excited than most people that I know and more positive in the face of having a terminal illness. That really, that really takes some, some stuff to be like that. And, and he was such a positive force of creativity and he chose creativity first and he chose art first. And I thought, well, this is really a magic thing that, that, that he feels this way. And I remember having a conversation with him when the New York production was starting to go, starting to get a lot of attention, you know, and people were buzzing about it. It was starting to become the hottest ticket in town because people didn't know what it was. And, and we had played on the Colbert show. And um, I said, Oh, wow. Do you hope that this, you know, do you hope that this goes to Broadway and you hope that it's, do you see this being successful? And he said, I just hope that it's good which is really a statement and I think that I think that if you look at his career he always chose art. In fact, he chose art to the detriment of successful franchises. He shut down Ziggy Stardust at the top of its peak and people were sort of flabbergasted at that, but he said it's time to do something else. And he had a different vision for it. And I I try to take that to heart, you know, his choosing art first and I Finally, at this point in my life and this point in my career, I'm really, I've really made that uh, a mantra for myself in a way, and I'm trying to make some moves to to choose creative music first, if if, if possible, uh, and creating some new projects and uh, working in creative circles and collaborating creatively. So I, 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 that's one of the reasons that I've gone full bore into this band and. Um, and it's rewarding. It's very difficult, but it's rewarding. Well, I think I think that's really wise. I mean, at some point, it's really more about being engaged and being curious and being happy. And everything else kind of, you can worry about it, but it tends to sort itself out in the background, at least in my experience. So that's that's amazing, an amazing perspective you have. I, I think that's right. And New York is, has become such a consumerist city, and, and, and New York's always been there's been a faction of New York that's always been about money and it feels more and more about money now because there's so much, so much young money here and tech money and finance money. And, 
if you just look at it on a surface level, you could say, wow, I, I should make more money. I should, you know, I should get into this and that and I should I should really try to maximize my blah 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 and and get more things but but that's not what life is about <laughs> it can't be about that it's you only go around once cuz you know at this point in in anybody's life if you're 20 you're going to have friends who are going to die in 5 years and every every year you go by and you say all right well two ways to think about this. If you were going to die next year, what would you be doing right now? What would be important? Or if money were no object, what would be important? Your videos that you've made on YouTube, where you take clips of the news, some of it's political, some of it's not. How do you hear the harmony? How does that, how does that even work? Well, voices are monophonic instruments. So um, there's some sort of pitch information there. And... Uh, Maybe the easiest way to make a a comparison is if you're looking at stars and you find you see a constellation and people used to look at stars and they say, oh, that's a scorpion or that's a goat. Or if you look at a cloud and it looks like something. Um, so I, I start to I start to hear these melodies in the voice. And and with that, those speeches that I did, I chose them partly because they were preposterous. And at the time, uh, particularly two of them, uh, Sarah, Sarah Palin and George Bush, I just thought that these are so ridiculous and I have to do something with them. And I, this is not a new idea about harmonizing non-musical elements. Hermeto Pasquale did it and uh, on a record called Fetos, Fetos do Du, I think. And... Uh, he, he, you know, I, I heard that idea from him before, but uh, with those political speeches, as people like to call them, I, I just, I started to hear harmonic shapes and that influenced how I harmonized them because the notes are just one thing and they're, they're notes out of time. But if you start to hear them as shapes, here's a little element of a shape and here's another little element of a shape that feels like a cadence and you could make it into something else. Um then you can then the interesting part for me is to try to make some music out of it and to try to hopefully build some comedic energy with it that takes it around and and if i'm really lucky it pairs with the text uh but that's not always the case and i started working on one a couple of years ago i started working on one for our current uh leader and i didn't like the cadence of any of the text and I didn't feel like listening to the the lyrics <clears throat> so I stopped <laughs> and I haven't I haven't done one since cuz I'm frankly not interested in any of those lyrics just uh <laughs> well said um do these little clusters of melodic ideas do they jump out on the first listening or do you kind of go oh this is this is interesting and then you kind of listen to it again and again over time, and you start to hear it, or or does it just jump out at you? Uh, I don't I don't know about the clusters, but I I sometimes I hear things and they sound particularly tuneful, and and I say, wow, that's a really interesting speech cadence or speech pattern, and um, and as you hear people speak, if you're at a cafe, you can hear them speak, and they speak, and sometimes their voice goes up, and sometimes their voice goes down, or sometimes. People get into a pattern where they're always going back to the same pitch all the time. And and those are situations, those are harmonic opportunities, I would say. Uh, so I'd be more drawn to that sort of speech cadence. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. But. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, they're remarkable to say the least. I mean, wow. it's a, And is it how much, on average, how much work would go into one of those? Um, time a few wise. hours, I guess, like oh, so three hours maybe. So yeah. you'd knock them out in a day, basically, once you get going. Yeah, yeah definitely under a day. Right on. Yeah, if you drive you um, drive you bananas. Seven to yeah, <laughs> it's just it's first it's figuring out the melody and then it's harmonizing the melody just uh -huh. to, to put it to make it more simply to put it more simply. Sure. And other people have done it. I also know that you're an avid sailor. Oh, I love sailing. 
Wow, because growing up in Iowa is not a sailing hotbed, I'm guessing. <laughs> no, it's not, <laughs> unless you can sail in the cornfields. Uh, I learned to sail. I went to a summer arts camp for two years during my high school called Interlochen. Uh, Interlochen is also a, a high school academy, and it's a place of a bunch of serious musicians and artists and a lot of a lot of well-known musicians, especially classical musicians, have gone to Interlochen either through the summer or through the year. And I went there for two summers, and it's very intense. It's a lot of everybody trying to work really hard all the time and practice and feeling the spirit of competition and getting up at seven in the morning and putting your instrument to your face or sitting in a practice room and working and working. And I felt after after a few weeks, because it's a six-week program, or is it an eight-week program, I felt, wow, this is so much pressure. I need something to unwind. And I saw these little boats on one of the lakes because Interlochen is it's in between two small lakes in northern Michigan. And I said, wow, I need to find out what those boats are about. And I went down to the waterfront and there was a little waterfront center and they had these small boats, Sunfish and some other small boats. And I said, how do I get to sail one of those? And they handed me a mimeograph form, again, dating myself. It was a five-page mimeograph pamphlet on sailing. Took it back to the cabin and memorized everything and then came back down to the dock and I said, I'm ready. And they said, okay, well, show us you can put the boat together and show us you can sail. I put the boat together perfectly, left the dock, capsized immediately. Was in the water, got back on the boat, got it going, and I had the bug from then. You know, I was learned to sail and I started there and I came back from that summer at Interlock and saying to my parents, I want to sail. I've got to figure out blah, blah, blah. I didn't do any more sailing in the Midwest. But when I moved to New York, I did buy a small sailboat with uh, Woodwinds player Ben Kono and we fixed it up and sailed it in Montauk. And then I bought a larger boat in New York and I've just been smitten with it since. Wow, that's great. Are there are there things about sailing for you that kind of parallel um, music, or is it something that's completely different for you that you don't? Um... I think there are some things that parallel music, uh, not not so much in the skill of sailing, but in the beauty of sailing and the motion of the sea and the motion of the boat, um, and it's uh, noiseless because you're not running an engine you're working in an intuitive way as you're sailing and feeling the the wind and responding to the wind it's it's really beautiful and it's it's cheaper than therapy i always tell people wow that's great that's amazing um and if you were to offer some advice to um young musicians who are looking to seriously you know have a career in music do you have any advice that you would share that's kind of helped you the most? or? Yeah, I would say... Uh, I would say some of the things that were told to me back then, but I didn't realize how important they are. Um, play music with everybody that you can and try to compose something as often as possible, even if it's something really simple, because starting to use that muscle will be invaluable in your future. And just, if nothing else, composing will help you figure out who you are and what you hear and will help you expand your melodic voice. Um, and just be be open and receptive to a lot of music. Um, I, I think that those are the things that feel most important as a musician, trying to make their way you know, and also uh, the basic things, which people always say, but I can't express enough. Don't be a jerk. Don't be late. Come prepared. You probably find as time goes on, what you used to think being prepared was takes on, it goes deeper and deeper. Yeah, a deeper and deeper and maybe just different. Um, rather than than just one way of listening to the music, maybe understanding a little bit about the person that you're working with because... You're working with human beings. Very insightful. The tour with Fork is going to begin. What's the first date? Uh, we're st we're st we're playing in New York City at the Fifty Five Bar on the twelfth of March, and then we have four days in Italy at Modena, Ascoli, Pisa, and Mestra. 
and then Zurich on the 19th, Dublin on the 20th, and Prague at the Jazz Dock on the 21st. Jazz Dock is an f- uh, awesome place. You've played there. I, yeah. You must have yeah, played there. Yeah. Played there with Rudder a couple times, played there with Fork at least once. Um, after the Jazz Dock, we go on to Berlin on the 22nd, Kassel on the 23rd, Kassel, Germany, uh, Vienna on the 24th, Bucharest on the 25th, Madrid on the 26th. We're not sure the 27th and 28th, maybe something in Barcelona. And then we our last date is in Terni, outside of Rome, on the 29th. Wow, you guys are tearing it up. That's amazing. Well, Henry, I'm a big fan of your music, and I'm a fan of your thinking, so I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And um, I'm looking forward to catching up and seeing you again in Prague. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you for listening to the Loud Noise Podcast. I love to hear your feedback and want to make the show the best it can be. Please leave me a comment or tweet me at Steve Walsh Music on Twitter. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a couple minutes and leave me a review on iTunes. It helps get the word out about the show, plus I'd really appreciate it. You can subscribe to Loud Noise and you'll receive new episodes with new conversations full of tips, time savers, and advice to take your music to the next level. So dig in, get out there, and make great music. Until we meet again further on up the road, cheers. Cheers.